the blap, the mig master, the ensign eliminator, the last of the gunfighters, the vot later LTV, F8 Crusader. Well, originally F8U and later F8. And these are two 172 scale diecast models from Century Wings. You've seen this one before. And this is a new one that just came in. Hi, Misha here. And let's talk again about one of my favorite Vietnam era jets and look at how the US Navy and US Marines used it differently. Also, I'm getting over a bit of a cold, so apologies if and when my voice gives out. But I really wanted to talk about this bird. Here's the new one. This is 1967. USS, I, mean, I can't actually remember if it was the Ticonderoga, I believe it's the Hancock, Vietnam War, U.S. Navy. And like I said, this is from Century Wings. And I really like what they do. Unfortunately, they don't do a lot, but they remind me a lot of Hobby Master. And in, from what I understand, once upon a time, the two companies shared tooling, had a partnership. One kind of did work for the other. And um, in a lot of ways, I think that Century Wings does it better. They seem to have more moving parts. They come with quite a bit of ordnance, high metal content. And generally, I do like the stands better. They're a little wider, kind of with this Y shape and they slot into the plain tight. My only gripe about the stands, they're all plastic, whereas some of Hobby Masters are metal, but not, not all for sure. So if this were a metal stand, at least the base, I'd pretty much categorically say better. I put this in my cart, took it out, put it in, took it out, and then finally went ahead and jumped with it. <laughs> Couldn't make up my mind because I already had one, but I really just like this bird and um, wanted to display one in its original fighter role here because this really was the Navy's best MiG fighter from 1965 through 1968 and maybe even beyond and its history is quite interesting too so gotta lay it out differently these cost about the same as Hobby Master 100, 120, 130 bucks. And they have the same features. They don't come with two canopies, open and close. They actually have one canopy that's hinged. They do have gear up or down that can be inserted either way. And they have optional ordnance loads. And they have some moving parts on the plane we'll look at in a minute. But first, I gotta talk about the history because it's me. Now this is the F. 8E. At least that was its name after 1962. Before that it was known as the F8U-2NE. It's pretty much the ultimate version and most of the older birds were, were updated to this to some extent. But the design actually dates back to the Korean War. In 1952 the US Navy put out a request for a new carrier-based day fighter. It needed to be supersonic, at least Mach 1.2, but it also needed a low landing speed of about 100 miles per hour. And they didn't want it armed with 50 caliber machine guns. No, it needed 20 millimeter cannon. They were realizing this was, you know, what they had to go because they were going up against MiGs in Korea with 23 and even larger cannon and they realized that was just what they needed to do and of course being a naval aircraft operating from a carrier it needed to have range and all that and the team at Vought led by John Clark developed what was known as the V 
383. This was a single seat, single engine jet, basically using a modified F100 Super Sabre engine, the J57 Pratt & Whitney. And it had some interesting uh, characteristics to the airframe to kind of meet the requirements. And it would, uh, the design would go up against, in the spring of 53, eight other concepts, including the uh, F3H, which would evolve into the very famous F4 Phantom, as well as a rather hastily modified F100 Super Saver from North American to make it a carrier aircraft, as well as the what would become the F-111, which interesting was put into production as kind of a, a, a insurance policy. But early that summer, the Navy would order three prototypes as the XF-8U, and this would be their new carrier fighter. So they would uh, begin construction at Vought, and the first prototype was uh, ready to go in the beginning of 1955 and took to the skies in March. And things went remarkably well. It went supersonic on its first flight. The second prototype would fly in September of that year. And actually the third prototype was canceled and actually would become the first production model because there were just so few changes that needed to be made. So only two prototypes ended up being built but the first production model flying at the end of September 1955. So with the factory testing done, they decided to hand it over to the Navy, which began carrier trials in the spring of 56, and then weapons testing and trials in 56 towards the middle and end of the year. And the very first ones were handed over for squadron testing and whatnot in December of 1956 to the Navy. And already by April of 57, it would go on its uh, first cruises, first aboard the USS Roosevelt, and then soon the USS uh, Saratoga, with its first station being in the Mediterranean. And then later in that year, 1957, the Marine Corps would get their first F-8Us, as they were known, F-8U-1s. And uh, both in the Navy and Marines, it would place the uh, F-7U Cutlass, known as the Gutless, as well as some of the F-3Hs in service. So it's in full production, what have you, by 1957, and is going into, uh, into active use throughout the... Uh, throughout the Navy and Marine Corps. This was not an Air Force bird, though. So how did we get from the F-8A, or the F-8U-1, to the F-8E, or the F-8U-2-N-E? Well, the first update, we'll just call it the uh, F-8U-1E, later known as the F-8B. Yeah, I know. This is what it is. This was the first update early on, and it had an early radar. It's a limited all-weather capability. It also had the first of many upgrades to the, uh, to the engine. It would soon be followed by the F-8C, or the F-8U- well, just, we'll just go with the F-8C. Yeah, I'm not going to keep you here too long, plus again, voice. The C was a pretty big step forward because they introduced these fins under the fuselage, we'll look at in a minute, to kind of work for better stability. It also introduced an improved radar, another engine upright, and introduced these little Y pylons on the uh, kind of chin of the cockpit. The original versions actually used single piece pylons and they do give you these with the models. Doot, doot. 
but with the C they introduced the double pylon or the Y shape. And that's because originally this was designed with four 20 millimeter Colt Mark 12 cannon with 125 rounds. That was meant to be its primary armament. Secondary though, it had a tray that could hold up to 32 unguided folding fin rockets, kind of like the F-86D. And since it was going into service in the late 50s, it started to carry the AIM-9 Sidewinder, but this was a very new piece of kit at that time, so they didn't want to totally rely on it. But as it began to really prove itself, 58, 59, they leaned on it more heavily. In fact, already by the C, the rockets were not really being used, and by the D model, FAD, they completely removed the rocket tray and replaced it with an additional fuel tank and yet again upgraded engine, and yet again made some minor improvements to the radar and what have you. By this point, we're in the F8U2s, two, and the final version here would be the 2NE, or the F8E, and this is the major one. We have a larger nose for the 93 radar, excuse me, 94, we have a new sensor here. We have a hump for electronic gear. You'll notice this on planes like the A4. That's for the new, at the time, AIM-12 Bullpup air to surface missile. We have yet again an upgraded engine and we have a Martin Baker ejection seat. Pretty common piece of kit now. And this was introduced around 1961. They would produce the most of the original 8A model, but next up would be the E model, and many of the A's were updated. So that kind of takes us where we get. Now in 62, the naming conventions were thankfully changed and simplified, and that's where we get it here. And by this point, she's in service, but actually the first version to really see a mission of importance was the RF-8 reconnaissance version, which throughout October 1962 flew missions over Cuba, taking 160,000 pictures during the Cuban Missile Crisis over about six weeks. Uh, very dangerous, very risky, also very useful for intelligence. So it wasn't just U-2s helping out there. Now in the Navy, this was their fighter. So by the 60s we have four AIM-9 Sidewinders, and four Colt Mark 12 cannons. It could always carry under the wings, but on this model, they actually give you plugs for the hard points, and that's what I've done here, because in the air-to-air -air fleet defense, whatever you roll, it really would not have uh, needed anything there. Those were not for air-to-air -air missiles. By the way, the fins I was talking about are here. And so this was their primary fleet fighter. Now they would take their final delivery from, at the time, LTV in September of 1964, and they built just over 1,200 of these counting prototypes and pre-productions and yada, yada, yada. So not a small number. But it was just getting into service. In fact, it saw its first major engagement at the Gulf of Tonkin incident with the USS Ticonderoga, where these were used to quote unquote defend the US fleet, and they used their guns and either rockets or missiles, sources kind of vary, to sink at least one North Vietnamese boat, essentially starting the Vietnam War. And then it wouldn't be long, in the spring of 1965, these would start encountering the MiG-17. In fact, it was about the best thing the Navy had to counteract the MiG-17 and then the later MiG-21, especially during this early half of the, uh, of the war. So it now has a radar, we have extra fuel, we have four missiles, we have four guns, and we have pretty good performance out of this. 
and it has some really interesting features as far as the frame. This aircraft is about 54 feet by 36 feet and it very much exceeded the maximum speed reaching over 1.8 Mach which was greater than what the Navy originally wanted also much greater than the uh, competing F-111 so uh, did I say F-111? I meant F-11 you know what I meant anywho I'm tired and sick <laughs> And it also was able to safely operate from a carrier, and that's where this interesting design comes from. We have a dog tooth edge to the wing. We have a very high mounted wing. And we have all moving stabulators here, and they do move on this model, which I think is really neat. And they move together, and this is metal. But what to me is super neat about this model is the wing itself moves. So if I can do it here, it is stiff. There we go. This was a variable incidence wing. It only moved about seven degrees down for takeoff and landing, but that was enough. And in flight, it would snap back to the standard position. Keep in mind this is also a high mounted wing. It's just an interesting airframe. And again, we still kind of have the intake in the front, very reminiscent of the Super Saber and this that era of jets. Like I said, the canopy is hinged on this, which is kind of neat. And this one's tight, I'm not gonna pry it open. But the pilot figure is removable. And it's essentially all metal. Like I said, they actually give you plugs for the wings if you want it in an air-to-air -air roll. But let's go back to the marine version we've looked at in past videos. I really wanted an F-8 for a long time, but they were totally out of print in America. Century Wings had not done any in a very long time, so I went to eBay International and paid a little bit more for it, about 150 bucks shipped. But I wanted one for the collection, and Marine or Navy, I didn't care. And it came in just fine. This one has the same features. And I've got it set up in the kind of ground attack role. And that's primarily what the Marines use this for. They would not typically operate these from sea, but rather from bases in South Vietnam. And they would uh, load them up. There's two hard points, one under each wing, plus the two chin points, and it still has the cannon. Now the original F-8 could carry about 4,000 pounds. The F-8E with the upgraded engine and improved airframe could carry about 5,000 pounds. About 4,000 under the wings and another thousand on the chin points. And this one has the Zuni rockets on the Y pylons. These are air to air or air to surface rockets. And under the wings we have essentially dumb bombs. They could carry about a dozen Mark 81s, eight Mark 82s, four Mark 83s, and I think you get the idea, all the way up to carrying those bullpups or even a couple of 2,000 pounders if we need to, so a couple of big ones. But typically it was the, the, the 250 pound or the 500 pound bombs. Now this didn't really have a, a guidance system aside from the bullpup. They were just, you know, drop, because this was primarily designed as a fighter. But the Marines made great use out of it as a close air support and ground attack aircraft as well. I think it's just interesting that it could be reconfigured and I think it's nice that Century Wings gives you options. You can either display the wings with stuff on them or not. And then up front for the chin pylons you have a total of three options. So not bad. 
And that was uh, pretty much it for the U.S. Marines and U.S. Navy. These would start to be phased out as early as 1967 in Vietnam, being replaced by the F-4 Phantom. But they would still serve a vital part through 1970 and even 1972. In fact, the final two active fighter squadrons in the U.S. Navy would not be retired until 1976, or where the planes wouldn't. I'm not exactly sure when the Marines gave theirs up, but they would replace it with more dedicated close air support, ground attack aircraft. Now the RF-8 that received such fame during the Cuban Missile Crisis would continue longer, serving actively until 82, and in the Naval Reserve until 1987. So it had a pretty long career considering they're all a couple of decades old, at least at this point. And uh, this had a good reputation in Vietnam. Um, it had a very good kill-to-loss ratio. These were credited with shooting down 15 or 16 MiG-17s and 3 or 4 MiG-21s. Even though it was called the last of the gunfighters, it only shot down 3 to 5 with its cannon. Most sources say 4. The rest were shot down by AIM-9 Sidewinders. But, you know, it was the last that at least had the concept of cannon as a primary ability. Keep in mind the F-4 originally didn't even have a cannon, so, yeah. Interestingly, the only planes that shot down more MiGs in Vietnam were the F-4, not surprisingly, and the F-105 Thud, the Thunder Chief, which is a little surprising for at least some people. But um, the uh, U.S. Marines and U.S. Navy lost 170 Crusaders in uh, Vietnam, but many were to accidents and otherwise just, you know, mishaps. They say only three, some sources say four, were lost to MiGs, and 50-some-odd were lost to um, ground fire, you know, anti-aircraft and what have you. Also, some were shot down friendly fire because that's what happens in war. Also, around 38 RF-8s were lost in Vietnam because, yes, the reconnaissance versions were used there as well. Why wouldn't they be? It's just, uh, yeah, it served a long time. And it served a long time during a period when rapid advancements meant that a lot of planes really didn't. A lot of planes were kind of in and out of service quite, uh, quite rapidly. And so for this one to hang around, I mean, it hung around longer than the F-100 in some instances, you could say. And it did see some foreign service, too. Uh, France famously had some. They didn't actually retire theirs until 1999. And uh, the Philippines purchased some from the U.S. in 1977. They were refurbished by uh, LVT or LTV. And uh, they updated them to a new standard. I believe they call it the F-8K. And uh, they would serve throughout the 80s in the Philippines. So some foreign service there as well. But it was a, a good aircraft. Now, as I said at the beginning, it was kind of called the Ensign Eliminator. And that's because of its pivoting wing and moving stabilizers and just high speed and performance for the day and time. And just having to be a carrier aircraft, it was considered a challenging aircraft to operate. For trained pilots, like during the testing in 1955 and 56, it was very smooth, but for new pilots and recruits new to the plane, it was a pretty steep learning curve. But then again, that's a pretty common thing for a lot of carrier-based aircraft. So, I don't know, just felt like doing an aircraft video, and since this one was new, it, yeah, what do you think? Both of these models are taken from 1967. Of course, this one would be aboard a carrier. This one would be aboard, uh, well, not aboard, but from a ground base. And just, um, I don't know. I think if I didn't like the aircraft so much, I probably would not have. I'm usually happy just to have one of each type, but, ah, what the hey. I only live once, right? And Century Wings is the only one doing a F-8. Probably the only one ever will. They also do a nice A7, which is uh, based on this. 
and I've talked about that in previous videos as well. So which one do you like? Do you like the uh, pure fighter role with missiles and guns? Or do you like the beefed up, see good stands, they don't fall over, version with uh, bombs and rocket packs? Let me know. With that, I appreciate you hanging out with me. Again, sorry about my voice, but it um, happens to all of us. This is Misha, and I'll catch you very soon next time.